Hello and welcome back to Char Reads. My name is Charlotte and today I'm going to be talking about Wintering, The Power of Rest and Retreat in Difficult Times by Catherine May. This book is part non-fiction and part memoir. The memoir bits are about um, this process of wintering, the idea that when something like really difficult happens in your life and you have to go into a sort of fallow period, like a period of hibernation, um, and usually it's quite sad and quite sobering, but also when you come out the other side, you're wiser and stronger. But it's also about winter, the season, and how that affects our, our moods and our purpose um, and what different people uh, do to, to make it through. This was published in February 2020. So at the point of publication, it wasn't known that we kind of all were going into a period of what she would call wintering. And it's really interesting to see how this sort of concept really does map to the way that we've all lived the last year. Having to be a bit more introspective and live life a bit more slowly and it being sad and difficult. But the thing about wintering is that there's always the end, you know, there's always another side um, that you get to eventually. And when you get there, you're more wise and more strong and more secure. Um, and that is a thing to look forward to. <laughs> I'm kind of gutted I didn't pick this book up in like December, <laughs> it's such a wintry read, it's such a cosy fireside kind of book. And now, although it's still just about February, it's sunny outside, like it feels like summer, um, which just doesn't suit the mood of this at all. This is definitely a cup of tea on a cold day and a blanket sort of read. I found the memoir bits of this book quite difficult to connect to. The prose was really beautiful and really poignant. Um, but it was, it was sort of like disjointed. The passage of time was quite confusing. Um, and it was a lot about her talking about leaving her job for who knows what, um, and also some difficulties with her son um, and problems with her own health and also problems with her husband's health. But her husband doesn't really come into the bits where she's talking about her son at all in a way that's like quite odd. It's like she's omitting information um, and talking about how like there's this, she's quit her job in all this uncertainty. Her job was as a creative writing professor at a university. And it's quite clear from the way time happens in the book. She's obviously quit her job to write this book, <laughs> but that's not really said explicitly. Like obviously she has a goal that she's going towards, um, but that doesn't really fit into this, this like narrative of, of wintry confusion. And I just found it quite strange that that was almost entirely omitted from the memoir bits of it. The non-fiction bits though, I found really phenomenal. They were quite random, just like a random array of stuff where she met a friend or followed a friend along to something that they were doing um, and how that connects to winter. But there were two bits specifically that I wanted to call out. The first is when she went to Stonehenge uh, with a friend and their families for winter solstice. So Stonehenge is this big like ancient monument on the Salisbury Plains um, and it's completely confounding as to how it was built because it's just giant stone and in theory no one would have been able to physically construct that and it's become sort of a worship site for the druids and pagans but just like a lot of different like religions and cultures and communities kind of ascribe a lot of meaning to the, the place of Stonehenge and I loved her talking about pagan rituals. So the way that they mark time is there are kind of eight significant events in the year. So there are the four um, solar events, which are these two solstices and the two equinoxes. <laughs> so when um, the days are longest and the days are shortest and the, the points at which it crosses 12 hours each. And then there's also festivals in the middle of each of those points, which is like, you know, the coming of spring and like they have different meanings. She was talking to a person that um, practices this and they were saying that it's really comforting to have like an event to look forward to every six weeks. Like we have a gathering, we have a community purpose um, every six weeks that marks the passage of the year. And you kind of have like an internal clock according to these events. And it just made me feel like I want to be a pagan. <laughs> like, I think something that um, I have struggled with, probably most of us have struggled with in the past year is just the, the passage of time and not really having any significant markers. In a Christian culture, which is what I'm broadly part of, um, you have Christmas and you have Easter and then I'm a, a summer birthday. So like those are my three vague points of the year. I mean, there's like a Halloween and stuff as well. But when I'm thinking about like significant sort of like family get together events, Christmas, 
Easter sort of and and my birthday but they're so spread out and I, I know there's like there are certainly other things to, to mark the, the passing of a year like other family and friends birthdays or bank holidays or whatever you want to do maybe it's going back to university um, or something like that but um, the idea of having like a purposeful community uh, festival around these like regular points in the year is so alluring to me. <laughs> I guess my actual personal passage of time is done on a very quarterly basis. This is super lame, but like um, at work, we, we organize all of our, the things that we have to do in our teams on a quarterly basis. And I do quarterly um, goals. Uh, so I kind of can mark the passage of time that way, but it's not a festival. It's not a get together. <laughs> like it's not something to look forward to, uh, which really feels like the rhythm of the year should have things to look forward to. So I want to do a bit more thinking about how I can like incorporate more of that like structure, but but particularly around like celebration and community into my year. The other nonfiction story bit that I really enjoyed was her talking about sea swimming. Um, it's really something that I want, I've talked to my mum a bunch about this because she moved down to Cornwall um, in the summer and it's one of those things that sounds, it's so alluring the idea of being someone that swims in the sea every day and even when I lived in Cornwall for a month I was like I'm gonna get into sea swimming and I obviously didn't, I went surfing like twice um, because it's just so, like the prospect of actually physically doing it for the first time but Every, everyone always says that it's just fabulous when you get in. The way she describes it in Heroes is beautiful. So her and her friend commit to, to swimming in the sea every day for, for, I think, a month. Getting into the sea on days when the temperature hovered around zero was an act of defiance against our own woes. By doing a resilient thing, we felt more resilient. That circular process of being resilient and feeling resilient kept us afloat. I think it's part of a larger group of things that you do like against your best physical interest, like the idea of having cold showers. Um, not only is that just like, woo, I'm hard, but it, it, when you do hard things, it makes you more aware that you're capable of surviving through hard things. Um, and it's kind of nice to build up that resilience voluntarily <laughs> rather than having to do it when your life gets really hard. Also, the, just the freshness and the smell and the early morning light um, it just sounds so, so appealing. We're actually thinking of moving to the seaside possibly towards the end of the year and hold this against me. If, you, if you're watching this video in a year's time, uh, just make a comment and say, hey Charlotte, have you, have you been sea swimming yet? Do you live by the sea? Because it's something you need to push for and you need to, to commit to a certain amount of it. But then once you start doing it, it's so revitalizing. So I love that bit. I think so many of, the stories she's telling about where she she's going to meet a friend they're so vivid and exciting and there's just there's this whole aura of female friendship around this book but it's never said explicitly but there are very there are very few men she's always meeting uh women and it, that's just weirdly empowering like you can feel these deep friendships behind um a lot of her interactions with these women that she's talking about uh and it's just lovely it's really nice so this has been Wintering by Catherine May, a selection of meandering meditations around winter, the concept and winter, the feeling. Uh, and I'm sorry that I'm going to post this video in March and it may feel a bit late for you, but if it's cold where you are, um, this is, this is just a wonderful book to read in winter. I would not recommend reading in summer. <laughs> I hope you've enjoyed this video and I'll see you soon.